Let's say a prayer. God, we are grateful this morning for the victory you have given us in uh, your son that we, through suffering in, in this present evil world, uh, can rejoice. And we don't do it with a, uh, a false face or a false thought about the evils going on, but we can look them in the face and understand something greater because of the knowledge and the wisdom you've given us through the gospel and through your word. We thank you for the hope that you provided for us and thank you for the folks here this morning who gathered together to encourage me and that we encourage each other as we are members one of another in the body of Christ. Amen. Okay. This morning, like I said, we're finishing our series on why God allows bad things to happen. And uh, you've learned so far uh, that God is not the one causing all the bad things in the world. And so first off, we need to recognize that. There are some Christians who think God ordains all of the minutia, including the evils and the sins and the horrible atrocities that go on. Uh, this is not what the Bible describes. In fact, there's a few times where the Bible says uh, it never entered God's mind, the atrocities that sinful humanity committed. Uh, what did enter God's mind is his purpose to save humanity. And that's what he's had since before the world began, is his plan for salvation and his plan to redeem humanity from the trouble they would get themselves into. Sin came by one man and death by sin, and pretty much a lot of the problems we face now is a result of that consequence. It was never God's purpose for the world to be stuck in all of this evil. It was never his purpose. That's what happened when, when, when man corrupted it, when sin corrupted it. And so meanwhile, you learned that. We also learned that what God is doing today is giving the dispensation of the grace of God to all the world which is that God offers all the world salvation freely by his grace. Grace means God does the work, we don't do the work. And so Ephesians 2, 8, the popular verse says, you're saved by grace through faith, uh, not by works, lest any man should boast. And so we don't boast in ourselves today. Uh, it's not by our works, it's what Christ did. You say, well, what did God do? Well, he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. Uh, he rose from the dead, defeating death and giving the payment for sin. And he is resurrected now in heavenly places and offers by his righteousness salvation to you. Okay, because what he did that was right, what he did on the cross paying for your sins and resurrecting to give you eternal life. So we have the hope of that. And so we understand that's what God is doing. Um, that gospel that I just presented does not require any miracle happen to you. The miracle was 2,000 years ago when Christ rose from the dead. What that means is what God is doing now is preaching a message. And so though the heaven is silent, though God is silent uh, it, in this dispensation, we don't see interventions today like he was doing back in Exodus or was, he was doing uh, before he died in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or even at Pentecost when the apostles were looking to go into the kingdom. We don't see that sort of divine intervention. What he is doing today is preaching a message of reconciliation. He's preaching truth, the cross, the gospel, to see all men saved and come to a knowledge of it. And so that's what we are busy doing. We learned last week that, um, or a couple weeks ago, that since God's doing that, we often have a problem with our flesh and we, we want to know how we ought to live then in this present evil world. And we learn that we walk by faith, not by sight. Right? So uh, this is all review. Today's the conclusion. But there's seven weeks prior to this uh, that we've been learning. We walk by faith, not by sight. So many Christians today who think they need to see God, we heard this morning the article about the presence of the Lord. Right? and that we can touch him and taste him and we can see him and we can feel him. Um, that is not how God is operating today. Today we walk by faith, which means we hear the word of truth, we trust it, we believe it. That's what we know to be true. It's not that we see anything, there's nothing to see. What happened, what happened 2,000 years ago? What happened when you were saved is that you heard the message, you trusted it, and God operated on you spiritually. It wasn't some zap from heaven. It wasn't a feeling that you got. It wasn't the cold waters you were plunged into. It, it, it was you hearing and trusting, and that's it. There's no, there's no feeling that has to happen. There's nothing that you see that's different about you. You wake up the next morning, same body, <laughs> same person. But now God has saved you. He's given you, imputed to you his righteousness, his forgiveness, and the promise of eternal life. And so we walk by faith, not by sight. That begs the question regarding healing and miracles today, which we dealt with in detail. We asked the question, will God heal me? Uh, so many Christians ask this, especially when they're sick. It's a right thing to ask this. And we covered how we pray to God and, and we make requests to him about, you know, I'm not feeling good. But God is not obligated to intervene on your behalf. He hasn't made you that promise. But what he has done is provided uh, comfort in your sufferings. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 that he's the God of all comfort and has comforted us in our tribulations. Okay? 
And so we learned last week how that was. If God is not going to take away my infirmity, what is he doing to help me in my infirmity? And we, so we saw last week that God has uh, given us the gospel, number one, which is not just a past thing that you get saved uh, when you heard it, but it's also you believing uh, Christ giving you the hope of resurrection. So you having this future hope is a comfort to you. And so you living a resurrected life in Christ can comfort you. We learn that the scriptures help change our minds so that when we live, we live with the knowledge of who we are in Christ. And this, again, is a comfort. It strengthens our inner man. We learn that what's important when we, have healing, or when we need a healing is not to put our hope in our flesh, our hope in our healing, rather put our hope in the Lord that we can be strengthened in our inner man so that we can walk through these things, we can live through these things to do God's will, right? And so uh, we learned that as well. We learned the third way that God comforts us is through the church. And we're going to cover a little bit of that this morning as well, how uh, we find comfort in the church. So if you're hurting, if you uh, need help, if you're overwhelmed with this world and the bad things going on, this is a function of the church, which is why it's important to have a church and not why we're all just loners by ourselves watching TV. It's we're, we meet together, gather together for functions, and one of them is the comfort of one another. Uh, because it does strain us uh, when we have the burden and weight of this world and bad things happening that we need to gather together to comfort one another. And so we do that. And so the church has a, a, a responsibility in that regard. So we bring us to this point this morning of we know why God allows bad things to happen, what God is doing and dispensing his grace, why God is silent today, and what God is saying to people today through the gospel. Um, we, we understand that God may not heal you, but that God has given us a greater hope in the Lord. We know how he comforts us through his word. And yet Paul says in his epistles that he glories in tribulations. In Romans 5 verse 2, in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, I take pleasure in necessities and infirmities. He says in Colossians 1, I rejoice in my sufferings. And you read that and you go, wow, I don't understand what that means. Because we've been covering for seven weeks, suffering's a bad thing. And it's bad and it hurts and it's horrible and we, all of our questions have been trying to answer how to deal with this. And that's pressing, that's what people need. But this, if I would have preached this the first week, you'd have, you'd have you'd thrown me out there, that's ridiculous. That's not an answer at all. You know, I'm facing suffering, I'm gonna say, well, just glory in it, you know, just rejoice. That sounds like nonsense. And so really, this is based on the foundation of seven weeks prior. We need to understand that. And so um, let's deal with how to glory in infirmities and what Paul says about how he and why he glories in them. Okay, what is he, does, he, does he like being hurt? You know, does he like the pain? Why is it? So first, we need to, to, to define a few terms here. One is the word comfort, which we started talking about last week um, and how God comforts us. But really, that word comfort really just means to strengthen Okay, is what this means. It means when you need comforted, you are hurting in some way, you are weak in some way, in which you find comfort in some other thing. And we dealt last week with how the world does that and how the Bible does that. So comfort means to strengthen. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, Paul tells the Thessalonians to comfort one another. And this is going to be the starting point for learning how to glory in infirmities, because you just don't snap your fingers and glory in it. You don't turn your frown upside down and just be happy about it. That's, that's, that doesn't work that way. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11. Paul says to Thessalonians, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also you do. So comfort, edify. Look at verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Comfort the feeble-minded. They're not solid, they're feeble. Support the weak. They're weak. They can't stand on their own. They're sh they need strength, right? And, and don't think that, that you are always past this as well. Uh, there are times when even the strongest of us have weak points, right, and weak times. And so the church has this function here to support the weak, comfort one another in verse 14. Notice also in this list, it's just interesting, it's not our topic this morning, is that in this list of uh, people who need comforted, strengthened, and supported are unruly people. It says, Warn that are unruly. Unruly people just simply shows a weakness in their self-discipline. That's what that is, in their discipline, in their, in their spiritual life. That's what unruliness is. It's a weakness. You know, in the same way that the weak need comfort and support, they need to be warned that you're being unruly. But another lesson for another day. Um, the point is the church has a function to comfort and to strengthen and to support. 
Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, one way we get the support is, like I said before, knowing the gospel and reminding ourselves that this world is not the world that God intended in his creation when he said it is very good. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, we know that Paul praises the Lord for the gospel, um, that the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. God wants to deliver us from this world. Now, many Christians want to stay in this world and have God deliver them from their healing. God would rather deliver us from this, this present evil world. So we learn that God's intention is to save people. Okay? His healing plan is resurrection. You die and resurrect. But notice also verse 4 says we live in a present evil world. And so we should not say things like some Christians do, denying that we, we live uh, in a present evil world by saying we live in the kingdom of God today. Well, that's just silly. Okay, God is not reigning on the earth today the way he's going to. Okay, he's not, op the, the, the people on the earth are not operating according to God's principles in his kingdom. Okay, and of course there's sin and death still present. So we've got all these issues. But Galatians 1.4 says we live in a present evil world. And all that should bring some comfort just knowing that you understand the present times in which you live. Because if you thought you lived in the kingdom and you see bad things happening and God's not helping, wouldn't that cause some confusion? And it does. But if you know we live in a present evil world and God has provided the means for which you to live therein, this is a comfort, just half the battle, knowing, knowing the answer, knowing where you stand. Okay. And so we, we understand that comfort comes from the Bible. Comfort means to strengthen us. and We all need to be strengthened. And yet to glory is something else. When Paul says, I glory in infirmities, he doesn't just say God comforts me in infirmities, and he does. But he says, I glory in them. To glory means to boast, to take pride in. So people know how to glory. They may not use the word glory, but people know how to do that. They do that in, in things already. It's what you take pride in. It's what you boast in. It's what makes you excited that you boast in this about yourself or, or something in your life. Okay? Normally, people take pride in their strengths. Right? So you ask someone, you know, what do they do? What do you do? And they'll respond to you with either what they want to be or what they are or what they have done. They take pride in their strengths. Right? I've got three degrees, or I've got a business, or I've got a job, or I've got a family. I mean, their strengths, the things that they see that they glory in, things they take pride in. So we know what it means to glory, and Paul says, I glory in infirmities. What a strange guy. Why, why would you do that? I mean, why would you go around boasting, yeah, I'm infirmed, and I'm poor, and I'm suffering. What? That's kind of a very strange thing. Why would, you, why would you say that? Why wouldn't Paul boast in, for example, that he studied under Gamaliel? What's his name? Gamaliel? It sounds like the Smurfs guy. I forget what his name was, too. Anyway, he, why didn't he boast in that? Why didn't he boast in the fact that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews and that he was a Roman citizen and a Jew? And why didn't he boast in these things? So he has authority to teach on these things. He never did that. All right? Why didn't he boast in, in those things? Instead, he glories, he boasts in his infirmities. How does he do that? How can we possibly glory? And not only that, look at the top of your outline there. I, I quoted for you 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, where Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. It's not just that he glories in them. He says, gladly. I'm gladly glorying in my infirmities. So apparently, you know, you can glory in your infirmities kind of like begrudgingly. <laughs> but Paul says, I gladly do it. I will gladly glory in my infirmities. The next verse, I don't have it on your outline. He says, I take pleasure in. Really? There's a psychological condition that describes that. You know, I take pleasure in my infirmities. How does Paul get there? What is he, why is he saying this? This seems so far beyond just, you know what? I'm suffering. I need some comfort. You know, we can provide that. That's good. God provides that. That's good. How does this? And why ought we do this? <clears throat> How do we do this? Well, that's what we're talking about this morning, how to glory in our infirmities. First of all, I, I, as I mentioned a couple of times, I don't want to make light infirmities. So if you are infirmed, if you're facing the suffering, I'm not trying to make light of it and telling you just to smile through it, forget it, just to be happy, because that's not it. Okay. Uh, it, this is going to be an inward change that affects your outward expression is what it's going to be. And that inward change only happens by God's word working effectually in you. Okay, if it's not working effectually in you, don't make that expression. Don't try to, to put on the face, okay, because it's not true. It's not working in you, okay. And what you need is comfort. Go back a step. You need some comfort. You need to be strengthened in your inner man, okay. 
So suffering is a personal thing. It's fleshly. We said last week and a couple weeks ago that it's the most fleshly thing that we deal with. When you are personally suffering in your flesh, <laughs> that is very immediate in your life. There's nothing beyond that. I am hurt, right? First priority, deal with my hurt. That's what most people do and a right thing, right? I'm hurt, I'm in suffering, I need to deal with this to get rid of it, and then I'll do the other things, right? That's the first obstacle. For some people, they don't have that choice. They're suffering and they can't fix it. You know, so now they have to learn to live with it. And again, this is how, how last we comfort in the scriptures and God's word can help strengthen your man to give you that comfort. And how it's so hard for folks who don't have spiritual truth in their inner man to deal with them. Okay, it's not that they don't, but the world, when they're stuck in a condition of hopelessness in their infirmity, like there's no healing, there's no cure to this, okay, th there is no hope in the world. There really isn't. You're going to have to think about the good things, the world says, somehow. Make the best of what you got, right? Well, that's no hope at all. You know, that, that's nothing compared to what's happening to you. You're suffering. And so uh, Christianity offers a greater hope, folks, a hope in the Lord, an eternal hope, an eternal hope of glory. And uh, because of that, we can be comforted. But Paul, even in his present infirmity, says, I glory in these things. Suffering's personal, it's fleshly, it's immediate, it's, it's right around you. And so if you are suffering, if, uh, I want to reiterate, if you are damaged, if you are overwhelmed with the present evil in this world, okay, then this lesson is not for you. Okay, I need to make that clear. Because the Bible answer to you who are, is overwhelmed with sorrow and is suffering and does not know how to deal with it is not glory in it. That's not the answer. Okay, you need to go back once again and be comforted. That is the Bible answer. By the hope of glory, by the gospel, by the scriptures, by a change in your inward man to strengthen it. That's what comfort means, to strengthen your inner man. That's what you need. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In fact, you cannot glory in your infirmities until you are fully comforted. All right? So it's very important that if you do not yet have the comfort, that's the first step. You must first seek comfort from God thereby. 2 Corinthians 7 in verse, um, or 2 Corinthians 2 rather. Is that what I said? 2 7. <clears throat> Corinthians 2, verse 7. Here's an example where Paul writes to the Corinthians. Um, and this is, has not to do with physical infirmities, but it does have to do with a gentleman who was sinning and convincing the church to sin back in 1 Corinthians. And Paul told him to cast this guy out uh, so that he could, he could be shamed because he, he's causing trouble in the church with the sin influence and this sort of thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, some time has passed and this gentleman has, has repented. That's He's changed his mind about this thing that Sin is a bad thing, and I should not be teaching people to do this. Um, and so in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul makes the admonition to the Corinthians to forgive him, to comfort him. He says in verse uh, five, or 6, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. And verse 7 is the verse that I want to draw some attention to there that it is possible to be overwhelmed, swallowed up with overmuch sorrow, even as a Christian, okay? That you, you're so, you're drowning in the sorrow or the, the, the evil that you're facing or the bad things that you have that you, you're, I'm going to use the word lost, but I don't mean you've lost your salvation. I mean that you're drowning. You're overwhelmed. You're swallowed up by it, you see? That's very possible and has happened when people don't get the comfort that they need from God's word rightly divided. And so Paul exhorts the Corinthians, don't let that happen. He's, he's repented. He knows he's done wrong. Receive him back. Forgive him. You know, we're all sinners, right? He wants to do right. Receive him back. And so this, he's doing that there so that they will not be overwhelmed. So I'm doing the same thing here. When we're talking about how to glory in infirmities, if you're the one suffering and you're, you're, you're being overwhelmed and swallowed up with sorrow, this is not the answer. You need to seek comfort first. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be a lot in 2 Corinthians today, by the way. So if you plant here, you... We'll be turning many pages. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4. Paul says, Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. So here we have the first verse we're reading today where Paul says, I have joy in tribulation, right? 
But notice what comes before that. He is filled with comfort. See that? You cannot glory in infirmities. You cannot rejoice in sufferings until you are first strengthened fully in your inner man. Okay? That's why I gave the warning, the precondition, that if you are not yet that and you're, you're, the suffering knocks you down, you need to get comforted first. Okay, get strengthened. Get supported in 1 Thessalonians 5 by God's word working in you, by other members in the body of Christ encouraging you and helping you in that regard. Okay, be comforted. And when you are filled with comfort, then you will be able, as Paul says here, to be joyful in tribulation. Which is what God wants, by the way. He, he, he's not the one that inflicted the suffering on you. And neither does he want you to ignore the suffering. He wants to comfort you in your tribulation. And he wants you to be joyful in tribulation. Okay. But that only happens after you get strengthened, after you get comforted. So that's the first step. Glorying requires strength. Being filled with comfort. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Okay. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And so, before the strength that you get is by doing all things through Christ. If you don't know how to do all things through Christ, you're not going to be strengthened. You're not going to be able to glory. And so, if you, you have to first learn some things. You have to learn how to do things through Christ, right? We've been learning that in Philippians chapters 1 through 3, how to live a life in Christ, how to do these things in, through Christ, and not through yourself. Because that's often how people get overwhelmed. They try to do things through themselves and by themselves, and they get overwhelmed and they get swallowed up. Well, your strength is not in yourself, you see. Your strength is by learning how to do things through Christ. So we need to get that strength, be filled with comfort. That was last week's lesson. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. <clears throat> By the way, we'll get to it here in a bit, but, <clears throat> well, I'll save it for a bit. As you've learned through our series, rightly dividing the Bible is so important, and without which we would not have been able to come to some of the answers we've come to through this series, about what God's doing, why God is silent, or about miracles and healing. You, most Christians don't have answers to these things. But when we rightly divide the Bible, we, what we're doing is discerning in the Bible who God is speaking and to whom. We're trying to discern what God is doing today, because what he's doing today differs from what he was doing before and what he will do in the future. And so we're able to make those right divisions to separate what God's doing today from what he was doing before. And so that's so important to have these answers and, and to know how to glory in infirmities. And so glory requires strength. Secondly, glory requires we, we know the Lord's will, which is why I brought up right division. Because before we can glory in tribulation and infirmities, we have to know what God's will is. We have to be, that's what it means to be strengthened in our inner man. We're knowing some information. Strengthened in the inner man does not mean I'm just going to, you know, give it my best shot. I'm going to grit my teeth and I'm going to give it a college try. That's not strengthening the inner man. It's not determination of will. Strengthening your inner man has to do with getting God's words of understanding in your soul. And when you do that, that doctrine is the strong thing. You're not the strong thing. You say, well, how does a doctrine give me strength? You'd be amazed about how understanding God's truth, what he's doing in your soul, it's right there when suffering happens. And it strengthens your position and who you are and how you, you do things. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, uh, verse 29, it says, No flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, uh, who of God is is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Okay? We're talking about glorying in infirmities. Okay? And the only way Paul can do that is because he glories in the Lord. He's not glorying in his infirmities because he's glorying in his flesh. He's glorying in the Lord. So before we can glory in infirmities, we have to know the Lord's will. We have to glory in him. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. And this is, that's significant. We shouldn't gloss over that. Because again, you have a baby Christian, you have an unsaved person who does not know the Lord's will, they will not be able to, and they should not try to, rejoice in their tribulation and their sufferings. They can't. There's no reason to, you see. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Paul says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And so before you glory in infirmities, you've got to know how to glory, bring glory to God. You've got to know God's will, right? One more place in Colossians 
Paul makes this prayer to the Colossians that they would have spiritual understanding. Colossians chapter 1 verse 11. He prays in verse 9 that they, um, that they might be filled with the knowledge of God's will, of his will, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So their inner man knows some things about God's, God's, un, God's will. Verse 10, the purpose of that is that they would walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Uh, in verse 11, strengthened with all might. You see, so the strength we're talking about, the comfort we're talking about, comes from you understanding God's will. you from understanding spiritual things. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. There it is again. Paul says the end goal of you, verse 9, increasing in the knowledge of God's will and having spiritual understanding is that you be strengthened, comforted, right, when you need the comfort, strengthened in every other time, so that you would be according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Long suffering with joy. That's what Paul's talking about this morning. That's what we're talking about. Glorying, rejoicing, and suffering. And that only happens after you have the knowledge of God's will and spiritual understanding, after you're strengthened. Okay? The third thing, uh, uh, third step in how to glory in the Lord is glorying and rejoicing requires you to see how your infirmity, your necessity, your weakness is helpful to God, to others, and to you. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about. You say, well, how in the world is my infirmity helpful to me? That's how we're most concerned with. But how is it helpful to God? How is it helpful to others? And there are, there are ways, and that's why Paul glories in it. Okay? So just to review, I, I've already given you the, the three steps that you need to glory in, in infirmities. We're going to cover the rest of the day uh, how it is we see our infirmities as helpful. We need to be comforted, be strengthened in our inner man with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We need to know God's will. And then thirdly, we need to see how our infirmities are helpful, are to the good of God's will, of ours and to, for others. Okay. All right. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Thank you all for coming out. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 1. How is our infirmity useful? You say, I heard what you said, Justin. I just don't know how to do that. I heard what you said. It seemed like it makes sense, but I, how in the world is my infirmity useful? <clears throat> Perhaps you've been comforted, and though you're facing suffering, you know the comfort of the hope of resurrection. You know the comfort of the Lord, and you have that. You are strengthened in your inner man. You know God's will to see all men saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, God's will is plainly known. But how do we see our infirmity as helpful? 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is the first way your infirmity is helpful to others. In verse 4, Paul says, God is the God of all comfort in verse 3. And in verse 4, who comfort us, comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds by Christ. The first way your infirmity is helpful and is useful and is good it's not because it, it's hurting you. That's the bad part. The good part could be is that it, it provides you the ability to comfort other people. Because, for the simple matter, other people have the same suffering. Okay, it says in verse 6 that whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And whether we be comforted is for your consolation and salvation. The purpose, Paul says, that he's suffering. What he's using his suffering for, rather, is to comfort and console other people. Because if you're a person who never has any suffering whatsoever, and your life's been easy peasy, and nothing wrong has happened to me ever, you know, it's really hard for you to comfort people who have suffering. I don't know if you're one of those people or not, or maybe you're one of the persons that had suffering and someone like that's trying to comfort you. It's very hard for them to do that. You don't know what I'm going through, right? That's what a suffering person realizes. You've never gone through this. Well, what happens then? The world has support groups, right? Why? Because they realize that just sympathy is a pretty good help, right? They may not have solutions, but at least we can sympathize with each other that, you know, we've all got this problem, right? Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, the biblical answer starts with that 
It goes further than that, but it starts with this. Paul says, I have the same sufferings, and I'm glad that I'm suffering these things because I have the same sufferings as you do, so that when you're suffering, hey, we got something in common, right? I've got to do the same thing. Now, Paul here is talking about ministerial sufferings, suffering for doing ministry. But you know, it's the same thing in physical sufferings as well. You've got a physical problem. Someone's died uh, that's close to you in your family. Or maybe you've got some illness or disease or facing some tribulation in your life. Someone else who's experienced the same thing or a similar thing, this is a comfort. This can't be a comfort. Just to talk with them about the experience, right? To have the same sufferings. Consolation is what that provides. That's number one, how your infirmity is useful. Now again, realize, in order for you to get to this point, you've got to be strengthened in your inner man because if you're not, all you're focused on is, I'm hurting, I need help, I'm drowning, and you need it. But if you're strengthened in your inner man, suddenly you say, you know what? I, I can deal with this through Christ. Hey, look, he's got the same suffering. Maybe I can help him, right? Your infirmity is useful. Secondly, we learn to trust God. Your infirmity can be useful to you, can be good for you, because it teaches you by practice to trust in the Lord. Yes, yes, we trust the Lord when we are faced with our sins and we trusted the gospel to save us and God to save us through his death on the cross. And we, we say we trust in the Lord and we come to church and we study the Bible and we, we trust God, right? But when does this actually get tried? <laughs> when you face some sufferings. In 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9, when you face some opposition perhaps, when you talk about doctrinal suffering, ministerial suffering, you try to present the gospel to someone or present some teaching to someone and they oppose, they resist, they attack, you know? Suddenly, your fortitude of understanding, your persuasion is tried. Oh yeah, I, I'm fully persuaded. You tell someone, they attack you or they oppose you, and suddenly, you're on the fence. What happened? Not so strong, huh? Not, not as strong as you thought. Be strong. But when you're at that point, you can learn to trust God. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9, Paul says uh, in verse 8, We would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble. Paul didn't keep it quiet. Paul did not ignore it. The Christian response to suffering is not to say it doesn't exist. It's not real. We should just smile through it. You know, that's not it. Paul says, I'm glad that you know that the trouble that I went through. And he's always singing the, the lament here. And he says that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. So Paul, in verse 8, if you read that correctly, he, he's not glorying in that verse. He said, at that moment, I, I was at risk of being swallowed up. He said, it was pretty bad. He says, we were pressed out of measure. It was beyond my capability. Beyond, you know, it, it was hard, right? And he says that we were above strength. So here's my strength level. That was up here. <laughs> More than I can handle, you know. Paul says we despaired even of life. He says we had a sentence of death. They were going to kill us. And wow, that was trouble. We were afraid. <clears throat> Paul said not in verse 9, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead. <clears throat> Paul says one of the purposes and the usefulnesses of having these experiences of suffering and tribulation and infirmity is that, it, that they should not trust in themselves, but in God. You never really know what you're trusting in fully until what you are trusting in gets taken away, <laughs> it gets threatened, okay? Um, they say you, you know a person by looking at them, right? What they want to be, but you know a person who they really are by how they respond to the troubles in their life and their sufferings because they start to express their true character when they're facing suffering. If people are trusting in yourself and trusting in your ability and confidence in your flesh, when your flesh ability fails, when suddenly your knowledge fails, because I don't know the answer to that, or perhaps some, you know, something happens to you where you thought you were strong and yet now you've lost a loved one, Okay, because your confidence was in my wife, my confidence was in my spouse, my confidence was in people, and you lost the people. Suddenly, your faith is tried. I would submit if your faith is tried in that, your faith was in the wrong thing, right? Your faith should only be tried when people call into question the cross of Christ, which you should have the fortitude of understanding that the cross of Christ is true, and it's the gospel, and the God's word it says it's true, and nobody can prevent him from dying. He already did it. No one can prevent him from resurrecting. Right? But if your trust is in people, if trust is in yourself, when you lose your fleshly ability, you'll be knocked out a bit. Your faith is tried, you see. So Paul says, these things, a sentence of death that I had in myself, he goes, that was so that I might learn not to trust in myself. 
Because, you know, I was doing pretty good, going from town to town, preaching God's grace like he wanted me to, and it was great. And then suddenly, they, they threatened to kill me. And, and I, I lost some hope. I, I, had, I, I was shattered a bit. And that's because Paul says, I needed to learn not to trust in myself. If God wants me to do this, it's going to happen not by my ability, not because of the success that I see when people like the way I talk and that sort of thing, not by his preaching, but because that's what God told him to do. He says, but of God which raises the dead. God raises the dead. And so that means God, though he doesn't delight in the death of the wicked, he wants to save humanity. If Paul, in doing his duty to the Lord, dies, that's no skin off God's back. He's promised resurrection to him. You see, Paul needed to learn some of these things. So when you're an infirmed, you can learn to trust in God. I don't know how it is with you, but it's happened to me before where I, I get sick. And the last few times I've been really sick, not just the, you know, the yearly cold you may get or whatnot, but really sick where it starts distracting half of your brain. Okay? Uh, that sometimes helps me. And I can testify to that as Paul does here. Now, I wasn't sentenced to death as he was, right? But it helps me because sometimes I get distracted with things in my life. I don't even know about it. I get distracted by things that I need to do or things that I think that I need to do that when I'm sick, suddenly those things fall in, in priority. And, and only the most important things are left. Eat, you know, be healthy. And what's amazing is that the Lord's there as well. And I have more clarity when I'm sick and reading the Bible and trusting the Lord because that's what's important. That rest of the stuff, you know, that's second, third, fourth, and fifth, but this is it. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die reading the Bible. You know, <laughs> this is what's important. And so, I don't know if that, you have that experience or not, but that's what happens when you face suffering and all of the distractions go away except for what's most important. And Paul says we need to learn to trust in the Lord in that, in that time. Paul's in the prison. He's uh, persecuted. He's accused. And they're singing hymns. Why? We just like singing hymns, you know. Well, no, it's because he, he says a sentence of death. And he goes, if I'm dying, what's most important to me? Let me what's most important to you? Right? What, what, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what would you do? Right? Your response to that question says a lot about who you are, what you're trusting in. Right? Who do you want to be with? Right? Those are the people you love most, right? Well, it's the same thing with, with Paul, same thing with, with us, and the same thing in how he glories in infirmities, because he says it can teach us to trust in God. And so when I'm at the lowest of the low, and I want to be with God, I have to learn that lesson. And God is with me. He says in 2 Timothy 4, as he's facing death, for real, 2 Timothy 4, uh, it's right before him. He's been sentenced, and he's, it's going to be executed. He says, the Lord is with me. Okay, how does he know that? He's learned that, folks. <laughs> He learned that when God told him that Christ dwells in you, but then he learned it by experience when he learned not to trust in himself. Because the only thing left is him and the Lord. And the Lord promised me resurrection. I'm going to die. They told me I'm going to die. It's set for tomorrow at 6 p.m. And so uh, it's me and you, God. It's me and your promise of resurrection. Right? So it teaches us to trust in God. <clears throat> Look at Philippians 1, verse 12. <clears throat> your suffering... Your infirmity is also useful, can also be useful to embolden other people. Embolden other people. This is an amazing thing that happens when you suffer. Again, I, I just want to reiterate here, because I know people are going to be listening to this uh, in suffering. I want to let you know that this, these are not the answers to you if you need comfort. Okay? It's not for you if you're overwhelmed and you need strengthened to try these things. Uh, you're going to fall. Okay, you need help. But if you're strengthened, you know God's will, you understand that his, his comfort is provided for you, then your suffering can be used to embolden other people. In Philippians 1, verse 12, Paul says, I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel. Paul is in prison in Philippians, as we're studying on Tuesdays. And the Philippians were not, but they heard about Paul's imprisonment and were concerned for him. They were, as Paul says, moved. They were shaken they weren't even the ones infirmed. It was Paul. <laughs> he was in prison, and they were shaking because Paul was their apostle. He was their teacher. He was the guy that got them saved, right? So he, they're concerned for him. And Paul says, look, I want you to understand that what's happened to me is not a bad thing. Now, so this is Paul talking about glorying and infirmities because obviously it is, Paul. You're in prison, you know. And so he's teaching the Philippians all over the book how to rejoice in the Lord. But it's not to rejoice, oh, great, I'm, you know, I've got chains, you know. 
The reason why is because it says the gospel is being furthered in verse 12. In verse 13, it says that my, how is the gospel furthered because Paul is limited? How does that happen? In verse 13, he says, In my bonds, in Christ, are manifest in all the palace and all other places. Everyone knows why I'm here and that I am here. Okay, Paul was somewhat of a celebrity and he was known by people, okay, though he didn't boast in that. In verse 14, he says, Many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. That's what Paul says. He says, Since I'm in prison, people have heard about my chains and my trial that he's going through in Acts 21 through 28. They've heard about the trial and the, you know, as we follow the uh, Supreme Court case recently about the, the marriage and that sort of thing, and the arguments back and forth. It's all in the news every time that someone says something, you know. It, it, Paul is in a trial with Israel about the gospel he preaches, and he's beaten and imprisoned and put in chains, and he's going to Rome for it. And people hear about this. And because of that, people are emboldened by it. And so similarly today, Christians get behind and rally around some sort of public political uh, cause. In the same way, Paul says, my infirmities emboldens people. Wow, that's pretty useful. Should God have delivered him out of that prison? And, you know, Paul, we don't want you to be in prison. By my stripes, you're healed. You're out of there. Well, suddenly, there would not have been the opportunity to embolden other people. You say, well, I'm no Paul. People don't know me when I suffer. <laughs> what does that make a difference? I understand. I'm no Paul either, right? But when you're suffering and you're infirmed, you know what happens when, when the weak people are the ones fighting the battle? The strong people have no excuse. That's what happens. When you're sick, when you're weak, and you're infirmed, and you're the one going, you know what, I'm still fighting this fight of faith, and I glory in the Lord. Wow! Suddenly the guy over there who's healthy, and he doesn't have the same concerns you do, Wow, if he's doing it, why can't I do it? And that really happens. You know, we hear testimony after testimony. Uh, 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 people come out to Grace Ambassadors, and they see what we're doing, and it encourages them. Why? Well, if they're doing it in the cornfields of Swayze, why can't I do it? I'm in a big city, you know. Great! <laughs> you know, this isn't exactly suffering out here in the beautiful sunsets and things, but... People get emboldened by seeing other people in their pattern, but Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul, in his infirmities, people are bold by this. Okay? You know what emboldens me? It, it actually makes me a little feel ashamed. When I see, I don't want to offend anybody, when I see cute little old ladies doing ministry work, like passing out tracts and preaching the gospel, and I'm like, you're old, shouldn't you be retired? I mean, shouldn't, you, I mean, shouldn't you have been fought the faith, as Paul says? I fought the faith, I'm done, you know. But they're the ones leading the charge? Where's the rest of us? Why don't we do something? And it's because of the suffering. When you read the accounts of the North Korean Christians, and I don't know if they're really saved or not, but it seems their testimony is a lot clearer than some other places in the world. In North Korea, for 20, 30 years, there's a woman this last week gave a testimony in Congress, and uh, she was there, what, 20, 40 years, I think that's what it was, in, in, in prison in, in North Korea. And we, we read last year a letter from the North Korean Christians saying, you're praying for us, we pray for you. Why are you praying for us? And they said, because you guys don't know what you got. You guys have freedom. You guys have liberty. You guys have the opportunity to preach the gospel. We're stuck here in North Korean prisons. And our faith is vibrant because, you know, all we have to hope on is the Lord. And you're out there and there's so many distractions and you tend to lose sight of it. Wow. That kind of emboldens me a little bit. I mean, North Korean Christians who are eating rats to stay alive say that? I mean, what, what excuse do I have? Yeah, I'm going to go home and eat a good lunch. <laughs> it, I've, I have plenty of opportunity. Your sufferings and infirmities, you can use that, you know. When you're strengthening your inner man, use that to get some other people going. You know? Look, I'm down, and I'm still doing it. Right? That's why I say you can only do this if you're strengthening your inner man. Because if you're not strengthening your inner man, don't try this at home. Right? <laughs> get comforted first. Because if, if you can't handle it, and you say, do what I'm doing... <laughs> What are you doing? You're trying to do something you can't do, you know. Be strengthened. But when you are, you can glory in your infirmities. You can embolden other people. Because you're weak. Everyone knows you're weak. <laughs> and you're doing it. Okay? You can know the Lord. Look at Philippians 3, verse 10. Now, I don't mean here know the Lord in the sense that the only way you can be saved is if you're suffering. No, no, no. You can hear the gospel. Christ died for your sins. He resurrected. And, and you know the gospel. And, and you can know the Lord by studying God's word whatever physical condition you're in or experience or circumstance you're having. But Philippians 3, Paul says something. We studied this last Tuesday. 
where he says that uh, though he had confidence in his flesh, uh, let me reverse, he, he, he had things to boast of in his flesh, but those things that were gained to him that he could boast and have confidence in his flesh, he counted them but loss. He did not want to boast in these things because when he boasted in his flesh, he was not boasting in Christ. And so he wanted to learn to live in Christ and not in himself. Again, this is something that only Christians understand to do because the unsaved person doesn't know Christ at all, so why would they even try? You know. But here we have Christ being our hope, our life, our forgiveness, our sanctification, our righteousness. And Paul says, in Philippians 3, uh, down in verse 10, that he, um, he counts all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, in verse 8, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. There's something you can learn through suffering, okay? And so it's useful, you see. Now, if, again, if you need the comfort, get the comfort. But if you're strengthening the inner man, you know God's will, and you're able to stand in this, realize you can learn something in your suffering. You can learn to have the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ, the power of resurrection in you. As I just mentioned, weak people doing ministry, <laughs> how in the world, by what power are they doing this? What drives them, you know? this, the power of resurrection, the hope of glory, God's will, the time is short, you know, the need is great, the hour is late, you know, it drives them to do this. Philippians 3 and verse 10, the fellowship of his sufferings, Paul says, I want to know Jesus Christ, not just to know him in, you know, in a relational sense, and I love him, he loves me, you know. No, I want to know his death, his resurrection, and we say that from the Bible, we, we say that's what we want, but do you really want to know his death? Because that means you're going to die. You see? And so when you're faced by the circumstances with the sentence of death, that puts you right in the position to know uh, Christ's death, right? And the power of his resurrection. Why did Christ go to the cross? Hey, he's going to resurrect. He, can't, he went to die. But he's going to resurrect. The, the Christians have a hope, you understand. Christians face death with a hope. And when you're suffering, it brings you face to face with the need to learn that lesson. The fellowship of the power of Christ's resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. Colossians 1, 24. This is why Paul says, I rejoice in sufferings. Okay? Because just as Christ suffered for the church, Paul says, if that's what I'm doing, suffering for the church, glory to God for that. Okay? By the way, husbands, that's your example as well. So, you have some suffering? It's not for your wife to take care of it all the time, even though, praise God, wives take care of us when we're hurting, right? It's for you to say, you know what? I rejoice in my sufferings that I'm able to provide for my family as Christ provided for his church. That, isn't that Ephesians 5, as Paul teaches? That's the example. In Colossians 1, 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Christ loved the church. He wanted to provide salvation. He died for them. While well, they were still sinners. Romans 5 verse 8, okay? Colossians 1 24, Paul says, if I want to know Christ and I want to, uh, to, to be in his body as his minister, he says, I need to love the church, to rejoice in my sufferings for them, as Christ did. To fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for the church's sake. Christ suffered and died. We're in the body of Christ. His head's up there. Our head's up there. Christ is in heaven. He's not suffering anymore. But you are on earth. You are suffering in this present evil world. Less so in America. More so if you're sick and infirmed. Right? And the, when you could say, I rejoice in my sufferings because it's going to help others. It's going to help me. It's going to help the church. Help them grow. Help them be emboldened. It's going to help them when we do ministry work and you're opposed and you suffer for that. It's, it's for their sake. It's for doing God's will's sake. You see, you see the issue there? So, thus the teaching, husbands love your wives. Right? Husbands love your wives. Ephesians 5. Christ loved the church. And he did that amidst suffering. Um, Paul says he wants to know the Lord in the fellowship of his suffering. He wants to be the savior of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You know you smell. All of you smell. <laughs> you smell, 2 Corinthians 2, it says to all men, and uh, how you smell to them, Paul says, uh, is their fault. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 2, 
in verse 15. Uh, now thanks be unto God, verse 14, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor, that's the smell, of his knowledge by us in every place. And so we are the smell of Christ, is what Paul says, this, as an example, right? In verse 15, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, because we're doing his will, preaching his gospel. Uh, we know God's will, and we're doing it. We are a sweet savor. Of Christ. We are saved by God's grace. We're preaching his grace, not ourselves. We're a savior of Christ. We smell of him. We're in suffering, as Christ was, and dying daily, and preaching the power of the resurrection, just as Christ would have us do, right? So we're the savior of Christ. We smell like Christ. That's how you should smell, right? Um, but in verse 15, it says, in them that are saved, but in them that perish, in verse 16, it says, to the one we are a savor of death unto death, to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? To those that are saved, we smell like life. It's hope that we preach. When we preach Christ crucified and you're in Christ and so you live the crucified life, we go, yeah, that's, that's right. I want to smell like Christ. Right? I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. You say that to an unsaved person, they go, what? You're glorying in death? Death is what you're preaching? Crucifixion? And they see hopelessness. They don't see the hope of glory. They don't believe the resurrection. They don't understand the, the power of resurrection you have in Christ. And so you're smelling to them like death. Right? Which we understand to be exactly what's necessary. We couldn't do it. We are sinners. We die. Paul says to reckon yourself dead. Galatians 2.20, Paul says we're crucified with Christ. The life I live, I live by faith the Son of God. Right? And so... To one person, a savor of life, to another, a savor of death. Paul says, I want to be the savor of life. Paul says, I want to smell like Christ. I want to have the fellowship of his sufferings. And part of that happens when you suffer, folks. When you face sufferings, how you respond to this is whether or not you're smelling like Christ or like anyone else who faces sufferings, which is that I can't deal with it and uh, I'm not going to trust the Lord. And I'm, even if you can deal with it, I'm just not going to use it for the benefit of others. You see? So there's this this experience you have knowing the Lord in your sufferings. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. If there's one of these reasons you take away today, this would be the, the most important. 2 Corinthians 12. This is where Paul says, I gladly, therefore, will rather glory in my infirmities. And he gives the reason. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. We, we've mentioned this the last couple of weeks because it deals with healing and it deals with uh, sufferings. And um, people who think that God is going to answer all of your prayers of healing, this verse is a big problem. Because you can't go through this passage and think that, oh yeah, God's giving Paul what he asks for, because he's not. I think it's 12, verse 7 and 8, he asked the Lord to deliver him from suffering, physical infirmities. And uh, in verse 9, Lord answers with a big no. But of course, we studied last week, he doesn't say no. He doesn't say no as a cold-hearted guy. He says, my, my grace is sufficient for thee, which is different than no. He doesn't say, no, I'm not going to help you. He says, I've helped you already. Okay, that's different. My grace is sufficient. So we learned last week what it meant that grace is sufficient and how God has provided the comfort for us. Um, but look what he goes on to explain. Christ went on to explain how his grace is sufficient. He says, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's key, folks. Lord Jesus Christ says to a suffering Paul, my grace is sufficient because for my strength, Christ says my strength, the strength of Christ, is made perfect in your weakness. Really? So remember that thing about you knowing God's will and you wanting to do all things to the glory of God and you being comforted already by the comfort that God provides? And now here you are going, okay, now that I'm comforted and now that I know God's will and Christ just told me that in my weakness, he's perfect, he's stronger. His strength is made more perfect. What would you rather do? You be strong or Christ be strong? You see, if you know God's will, it should obviously be Christ be strong. And this is why Paul says in verse 10, or verse 9 rather, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's the reason. He doesn't look at his suffering and his infirmities and say, I really love this, you know, bad knee. I really like this bad eye. Paul had some bad eyes, right? I really like not being able to see. It's not that he said that. He says, I would rather glory my infirmities because now Christ has taught me and I know that when I am weak, the only thing I can say is Christ is strong. 
Because I can't say I am, right? Which is the exact message we're supposed to preach. Christ is the one that saves us. Christ is the one that strengthens us. It's the hope of glory, not the hope of healing. And so when our hope is in the Lord, that's the only thing you can say when you're weak and suffering. So the weaker you are, apparently, the less distraction there is between you and other people and delivering the right message. This is why, this, this is contrary, by the way, to what people in the flesh want. I wrote this last uh, Saturday in an email that, you know, people measure success in America by numbers, right? How much money do you have? Uh, how many successes and awards do you have? This sort of thing. And in churches, it carries over, and they measure your success by how many people you have, how many numbers of people. But that's not the biblical measure of success. The biblical measure of success is not how many people you have. I had someone email me the other day and say that, uh, well, you can know if you're preaching the right message by how many people you got, because you know, God will bless you. No, you can't. By that standard, the Catholics would be right, and so would the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. The Muslims are fastly encroaching, and so you've seen the YouTube videos by the year 2070. They'll be more popular than we are. 2070, it's a long ways away. But that's what they say. It's not by numbers, folks. In the Bible, Jesus chose 12 guys to be his disciples, and all of them were gone by the cross. Paul, at the end of his life, only Luke was with him. He said, all those in Asia turned away from me. Okay. How often in the Bible has it been the minority? Pretty much all the time. How many people stood up when Nebuchadnezzar said, bow down? You know. Where was Daniel, by the way? You know. <laughs> Few. Minority is, the, is in the Bible all throughout. So you can't de determine by numbers. And the point is that people measure success by how many people you have. They're measuring it wrong. Paul addresses that in 2 Corinthians as well. He says, you compare yourself among yourselves. He says, I compare myself with, well, I don't compare myself with Christ at all. I'm in Christ. It's him. It's him alone. There's no comparison. <laughs> That's what he says. And so when he's weak, people said to Paul, you're in prison. You're sick. You don't take our tithes. You don't do our rituals. We're not following you. And Paul says, wow. I can't believe you rejected God's grace like that. You just rejected the truth because I don't, he says in 2 Corinthians 11, because I don't take from you. Because I don't beg of you. Because I'm not the healthiest. Well, we'll get there in a moment. Paul wants the power of Christ to rest on you. And when you're sick and infirmed and you know God's will and your strength in the inner man, you have the opportunity to have the power of Christ rest on you in a way that people that are healthy and that are wealthy and that are wise and are noble in this world have a hard time expressing. Okay? I'm not the smartest man in the world. If I were and was preaching the intelligent belief in Christianity, people would believe me not even understanding what I said. Why? Well, he's pretty smart. You know? That's the wrong reason to believe what I say by anything about who I am. Whether I'm smart or I'm good looking or you like my tie color, it's wrong, you see. Believe it because it's true, because of what Christ said. And so if you're weak, you say, I'm, I'm not good at preaching like you are. I, I'm not, I don't look as good as you do. I know I look pretty good. But If this is your issue, then you know what? Glory to God, because when you preach the gospel, that means there's going to be no, no issue with you. <laughs> you are inept. It'll be Christ in you. And when people believe the gospel by you, they'll be putting their trust in Christ completely. Right? Glory to God for that. You pray for a good infirmity, you know. Now, help me stutter more, Lord. Why? Because people won't like me then. They'll like you, though. You know. But people, and they're listening to that in the flesh. They don't like people study, stuttering. That's what I just did. <laughs> Thanks, God. They, they don't like that. Right? They want to see a good performance. Our church is a better band. We heard it this morning, right? People try to present the better performance or more authentic Christianity, the real religion. They're both performance. They're both boasting in their flesh. They're both boasting in themselves. Paul said, I'd rather have the power of Christ than the power of myself and how big we are and how great we are. Rather, it should be the power of Christ. And so that's why Paul says, I'd rather gladly glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. If you're strengthening the inner man, you know that that maybe should be what you pray. You know, that, that's what you rejoice in. He says in verse 10, in 2 Corinthians 12, Therefore, because the power of Christ can rest upon me in my infirmity, I take pleasure in infirmities. You see, he's not pleasuring in the actual pain. He's pleasuring in the fact that because I'm suffering and weak and need things, and I'm poor, it only elevates Christ as the great God and Savior of me. 
Because if I could do it and people saw me as being capable, they would think, oh yeah, you know, he can do it because he's him. <laughs> I can't because I'm not him. No, no, it's not because of me. It's because of Christ. You see, and the more of me that gets in the way is bad. When you're sick and suffering and infirmed and need things in your poverty, that means it's less of you that people can, can give credit to. And that's good. Okay. Second Corinthians, Corinthians 12, verse 10, he says, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. That is everyone's prayer list, pretty much. God, deliver me from reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses. Deliver me from all these things. Paul says, I take pleasure in them. I'll take them. Right, really? Because he wants the power of Christ to rest on him. Okay? Romans 4, verse 20, Paul realizes that when Abraham, what Abraham learned according to the flesh was that his flesh did not save him. Remember the story of Abraham? Abraham tried to do it on his own when God promised he'd have a child, and so his wife couldn't have one, so he found another woman. Right? But he learned a lesson through that because God rebuked him for it and said, no, that's, it's not through you, Abraham. I'm going to do it through your barren wife. And what's that teach us? It wasn't Sarah's capability either. It was by the grace of God they had a baby. Right? It wasn't because of Abraham or Sarah. Abraham could do it. He proved that. Thanks, Abraham. Sarah couldn't do it. Everyone knew that. It was by God's grace. Romans 4, verse 20. Paul says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And that describes every one of you who face suffering and afflictions. You have the opportunity to have your faith display itself in its clarity, right? What are you trusting? Only God. Can't trust the doctors. Can't trust my body. It's failing. You know, God's the only one I'm trusting. Well, what if you don't get a healing? I'm not trusting for a healing. I'm trusting for resurrection. And then I know for certain. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, now you're ministering and making us all to shame because we're not. <laughs> Going back to the previous point, right? You can, you can be useful in your infirmities is what I'm trying to encourage you with here. You follow a good pattern. Paul was infirmed. 2 Timothy 2.1, Paul says, Be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is what God did for you, which means you're not going to boast and be strong in what you did for God, what God did for you. Well, I can't do anything. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough intelligence. I, I, I just, I feel like I can't do anything. Well, great. That means God's grace will be exhibited very clearly in you. Because you can't do anything. God did everything. <laughs> you know the gospel, right? Yeah I, yeah, I know. I trust the gospel. Well, that's all there needs to be. You know, you have hope in the Lord. You do his work. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 30. He says this over and over again in his epistles. He says, I'd, I would rather glory in my infirmities. He, he wants to display himself as weak. 2 Corinthians 11, um, in verse 11. I'm in 1 Corinthians. He says in verse 10, As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Paul boasted in the fact that he didn't take money from people and that he suffered day and night to provide an income for himself so that he would not have to beg for other people for money. And he says, No one can stop me of this boasting. Why? Because I love you not, God knows. I, what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. People gloried in the fact that I've got... 2,000 people at my church, and we've got a staff of six pastors and two worship bands, and, and because we've got 2,000 people, we're able to provide for this, you know. And people look at that and go, wow, that's good. No, that's flesh. That's people, boasting in people. Now, if they boast in the Lord, then great. Being big is not bad. But if that's what they're boasting in is their size and the money that they're getting because of that, this is a problem, and Paul says, I'll work and suffer and spend my time to spend for you Corinthians so when other people look at me, maybe they'll try to pretend to be like me, and they'll do the same thing. That's what he says. And he says in verse 13, such are false apostles and so on and so forth. Down in verse 16, look what he says. I say again, let no man think me a fool if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. Paul says, I'm going to speak like a fool here for a moment and boast in myself. Because that's what everyone else does, boast in themselves. He says, this is my boast, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Also, people glory in the flesh all the time. 
And so it's the same way when you're sick and you're suffering. You want a healing because you want a glory in your flesh. Praise God, he healed my flesh. Right? I'm healed because of the Lord. Right? Well, no, that's not how you glory. You glory uh, in the Lord. But Paul here is going to try to glory in his flesh. And he says, You suffer fools get gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. You suffer if a man bring you to bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you. Exalt himself. In Christianity, we follow celebrities. People exalt themselves. Who's the guy that you put on the stage to fight the atheist? Right? It's, it's the PhD in philosophy. It's the seminary graduate. It's the wise of the world, right? Why isn't it you who know the gospel? Well, I can't combat all of the philosophical argumentation of the atheist. You know what you need? To preach Christ. Well, they're not going to see me as credible. Exactly. <laughs> you are not the reason Christianity exists. And neither is any other Christian celebrity. Christ is the only reason Christianity exists. And every one of you who put your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ are able to preach that same message because of Christ, not because of me. And these Corinthians, they were so proud of themselves and their church that they were offended by Paul because, you know, he's poverty-stricken and suffering. And, and Paul says, wow, you suffer fools get gladly. He says, your suffering is when people take money from you. Tithing, you know. Verse 21, I speak as concerning reproach as though I had been weak. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the son of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? So am I. But he says, I speak as a fool, because that's not what I want to boast in. He says, you want to boast in the flesh? Here, let's boast in the flesh. He says, I've had stripes above measure, prisons more frequent, deaths oft. Of the Jews I received, how many times? Five times received I 40 stripes, save one. And go on and on with his sufferings is what he boasts in. He says, look at all the sufferings I've had. Right? The only way Paul can boast in his flesh, look down in verse uh, 30. If I must needs glory, I will glory the things which concern my infirmities. Okay? You want to hear my laundry list of what my flesh has done? I've been sick. I've failed. I've made mistakes. I'm a sinner. I'm inept. Christ saved me. Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my sanctification. Christ saved me from my sins. Christ is my hope and my glory. He's my forgiveness. Right? What about you, Paul? Tell us your resume. Well, okay, if I must boast in my flesh, I've been in perils and in perils and in perils. How's that? Sure, join our church. <laughs> Teach our people to be perilous. That never happened. He never got invited to teach other, everyone else to suffer for the Lord. No one wanted to. Right? That's what Paul's saying, is that I want to, I want to know the fellowship of the sufferings. I know the reality that I can glory in infirmities. That's a hard lesson to teach. Okay, Paul is not, Paul is pleased in the power of Christ, not in himself. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 5, before the, uh, the prayer rejection there, he says, of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities, in my weaknesses. If you want me to talk about myself, it's only because of my weaknesses. That's what I'm going to talk about, it's my weakness. I will not talk about my strengths, because my strengths take away from the strength of Christ. That's got to, I mean, that's hardcore, Paul, I mean. At least tell us what you're good at. Paul says, I'd rather not. Yeah. Wow. So, see, this is how he glories in his infirmities. is because he's presenting himself as weak so he can pre present Christ as strong. <sighs> it's not that Christ needs the help. Okay? It's that we get in the way. Is what, what the deal is. So, look at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Paul says, Though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lived by the power of God. We also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. When Christ was on earth, he lived in weakness and suffered in weakness, but he lived by the power of God, just like you. You live today in suffering and a weakness, but you live by the power of God through Christ. Glory to God for that. Okay? Examine yourselves is what Paul says. Your weakness, by the way, begets the crucified life in you. The more you are weak and infirmed, this will help you understand how to live the crucified life, because it's not about you. It's harder for other people who aren't so infirmed, who don't have such need, us rich Americans, for example. We have lots of things that we can be happy in, and pleasure in, and take hope in, and rejoice in, and glory in, that we often don't live the crucified life. We live our own life to our own pleasure, because that's what we like to do. Take those things away. If you had no money in your bank account, you can't glory in that anymore, can you? You're poor. What are you going to glory in? 
Paul says he wants to glory in Christ, and so he lives that way. When you suffer, your infirmity can be useful to do ministry work. Paul says in Philippians 1, verse 22, that to live is Christ, to die is gain. For him to die is actually a good thing because he can have resurrection, he'll be with the Lord. But he says, I'd rather abide with you in this present evil world, in suffering, in prison, because of the fruit of my labor. Ministry work. Seeing souls saved and saints edified. Paul counts it a joy to be a service to other members of the body of Christ. Philippians 1, or 2, verse 17. So you're sick, you're infirmed, you're facing opposition. There's a reason why it's useful, is that your sacrifice may be for the good of others. We already talked about you can be an example. The Philippians were poor, and they gave to the Corinthians, who weren't poor. <laughs> and then Paul talks to the Corinthians and said, those poor people gave you money. <laughs> I robbed of them to teach to you. Isn't that funny? You're rich. So he's doing that obviously to rebuke them. You know, so that's a good example that you can be for other people in your suffering as well. It allows you to exercise your faith. Look at Romans 5, and we may stop around here. Romans chapter 5. When you're suffering, Paul says we glory in tribulations in Romans 5. Being justified by faith, we're at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a, such a helpful verse for comfort because when you're suffering and you think, is God doing this to me? There's so many bad things happening. You know, by Romans 5 verse 1, you're at peace with God, justified by faith. Okay? He's not doing it to you. He's not mad at you. He's not imputing your trespasses unto you. You're at peace with God. You put your faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. You have the power of resurrection. In verse 2, it's by Christ that we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And rejoice. More than that, Paul says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And don't we all want to say, yeah, we rejoice in the hope of glory and resurrection and what we're going to be. But he says, and not only so, it's not just we hope in the glory. He says, we can glory in the tribulations. And that's where everyone goes, no, no, we can't. We know the hope of glory. That's the comfort we learned last week. But glory in tribulations, how's that work? Because Paul knows something, that's why. He says, I know, because I know that tribulation works patience. And what is patience? But long-suffering to see souls saved. That's what that is. 2 Peter 3, 15 talks about this. Why is the Lord long-suffering? Why is he tarrying? Why is he waiting to bring the kingdom? Peter explains, because it's what Paul said. Because he's long-suffering to see souls saved. God himself is suffering long with all the sins that are occurring in order to see souls saved. He's offering grace. There'll be a time when he stops the suffering and stops the long suffering and he comes and judges the world for sin. Rather, you'd be saved now and Paul says every day is another day of opportunity to see souls saved and saints edified and so I know that tribulation works patience in me because I'm so impatient. I want God to do it now for me. I, you know, I just want to do it quickly. And he's learning patience. Okay, Patience works experience. Earlier we talked about how your suffering can be an example to other people and how you can sympathize with other people in the same suffering and having the hope of God, the hope of the Lord. Well, he says it works experience. When I have troubles, okay, it causes me to be patient through them, to endure through them when I'm comforted by the Lord. And that comfort in the Lord, that strength, gives me an experience that now when other people face the same sufferings, I can have that experience, teach others how to be patient in their tribulation. And that experience that I have over and over again, that I use God's word to apply to my circumstances and it gives me hope, it gives me comfort and strength, that gives me hope. Because now I see not only me being strengthened, but other people being strengthened. Now everyone's being strengthened by the hope of, of glory. Tribulation works patience, patience experience. That's what old people have, right? Because they live life. Experience hope, the hope of glory. It's a reality. You get hope through tribulation. If you know that your hope will increase by your going through tribulation, with the mind of faith. Do you want more or not? I'll just take a little bit of tribu less tribulation, please. Do you know that less tribulation could diminish your hope in the Lord? It's not a guarantee. You can have hope in the Lord without tribulation. I, what I'm saying is that it's harder to realize it. As we said before, it's so clear when you face tribulation, you only hope in the Lord, you know. So Paul says that, that's a good thing. Tribulation works patience, patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not ashamed is what he says in verse four or 5, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. He will say, why does God allow bad things to happen? He's such an evil God. No, he's not. He's offering hope to the world. He's the only one saving the world, offering true hope, and his hope does not make ashamed, because his spirit dwells in me, and because I know the love of God, that he died for sinners. He's an evil God to allow bad things to happen. No, he's a loving God. He died for you while you're still a sinner. 
We know that because we have the gospel in us. Romans 5, verse 5, right? So our hope is real, okay? And it helps in our tribulation, and it allows us to glory in tribulation, okay? This is what Paul says. It exercises our faith. It allows others to exercise their faith when they see us suffer. They have to count whether or not you've done some secret sin in your life, right? Well, now they've got to say, well, no, God still loves him. You're, he's at peace with God. He just needs comfort because he's facing sufferings like I could do. As, you know, I could face the same thing. I could face the same tribulation. It allows others to communicate to your need. In Philippians 4, verse 10, the Philippians saw Paul's necessity in prison. Said, hey, he probably needs some stuff, some money, some food. They sent him this. And Paul says, praise God that you saw what I needed and sent it to me. And he said, that's great. That's, that means that you, you're trying to fill the need, trying to minister there. Paul says, I didn't ask for it. And you know what? I didn't even need it. Paul says, I didn't even need it, but I, I love that, that you, you, you saw the need and you met it. Your suffering allows other people this opportunity. Okay? Otherwise, people think you're fine all the time. You know, we're just living our lives, right? But isn't it great when the church, when you have some suffering and suddenly people help you out? And you realize once again, or in your family, and they help you out, and you realize once again, hey, they do care. <laughs> God's love is working. It's an opportunity for people to exercise their faith and what a glory that is. And if that means you face some suffering for other people to practice out what they believe, hey, great. Great. So it allows others to communicate their faith. And of course, finally, people can be saved through your suffering. Not that your suffering saves them and it's not that you have to suffer to see souls saved. But when you do suffer for the Lord and you endure afflictions, as Paul tells to Timothy, when you endure all things to see people saved, that's a good thing. That's why God's putting up with it, right? The longer we suffer, the longer God is offering grace, as we talked about. It's no secret, then, why where places th where the church is suffering, there's growth, not just in numbers, but in, like, spiritual strength, because when the church faces suffering, it, it's faced with a decision. Do you really hope in the Lord? Do you put your faith in the gospel? Are you going to live this out, or aren't you? Right? So the church suffers, it grows. So how do you glory in infirmities? Because you realize that with spiritual strength applied to your inner man, suffering can help you and others, and God's will be done. Right? We don't pray, God, bring suffering upon me. We don't seek it out. Where can I suffer some more? <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't have to do that. There's a wrong belief that Catholics teach that. You know, I'm going to whip myself. That's wrong. But if while we're living our life, we face sufferings and infirmities, we realize the benefit, the opportunity that is. You know, and we can glory God amidst these, right? We can rejoice in these circumstances. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, in everything give thanks. We don't thank God for cancer and babies dying, but in every circumstance, we can give thanks to God that he has provided comfort and the hope of glory, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. We have the knowledge of how to do this, right? So th because of this, the Christian has hope. He learns to glory in his infirmities because of what he learns from the Bible while he divided. Any questions? Any comments about that? All right, let's say a prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word and thank you for what you've taught us. And there, There's no way we would have come to this conclusion on our own. And so we're grateful that you have revealed this to us. I pray that we would understand it so that when we are facing suffering, we would ourselves be comforted by you and by your church and by your word, but also be able to have the strength in you to do all things, to glory in tribulation, to rejoice in sufferings for your sake, to do your will. I thank you for the folks here who have experienced these things and for the comfort they provide me, and I hope that I can provide the same for them. Amen. Thank you, folks.